Okay, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, um, Mr. Vice President, esteemed colleagues, and honored guests, it's my honor and privilege to be here today to present um, U.S. Embassy response to the Tohoku, Tohoku crisis in coordination and cooperation with the uh, Japanese government. And as uh, Dr. Sakai did, I mean, it might be worthwhile just review just very briefly about what exactly happened on, on uh, September 11th. And uh, as we all know, the 9.0 earthquake attacked the uh, east coast of uh, Japan causing uh, some damage from the earthquake itself, but the most extensive damage was, of course, from the tsunami, affecting, as you see, the, the yellow areas on the map. And then that then led to the Fukushima disaster in the area in the red down in the southern part of the, of the, of the map area. And just to go briefly through some of the statistics again, uh, there are about uh, 16,000 lives lost from this uh, terrible disaster. 3,000 people were missing, presumed washed out to sea. Uh, 6,000 injured, and uh, Hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, half a million people in total, as estimated, with extensive property damage, as we just uh, learned about, and uh, a large area of inundated landmass from the water. And then approximately 110 kilometers of the seashore was, was also uh, flooded as a result. And then, of course, this then led to the Fukushima disaster. As we all know, the tsunami toppled the seawalls at the, at the power plants. This then led to loss of the direct power. The battery backup worked for a while, but then the batteries failed. That led to increased temperatures in the core. The core started melting, releasing hydrogen gas, and then a subsequent explosion from the, from the, from the nuclear power plants. Um, afterwards, um, various emergency personnel, firemen, doused the heating coils, the, heating, the hot coils with uh, from fire trucks from seawater, and uh, finally got the situation under control. And I think a lot of uh, praise has to go to the heroes of the Fukushima disaster, the people who stood behind, dressed up in the gear, got the situation under control. And I think they had deserve a lot of our honor and praise for what they did uh, for the Japanese people. And then looking at the zone of disaster, this is not long after the disaster, this, this map, so it's not the later data, uh, but shows the most of the radiation was deposited right off to the northwest of the Fukushima area, uh, the yellow area, and the green area, less or so, and there remains uh, an exclusion zone today. So my objective today is going to briefly kind of go over some uh, um, U.S.-Japan cooperation efforts that I've been involved in in another country, and then get in more detail as far as what the embassy did uh, here in Japan during the Tohoku crisis. Um, for two years, I lived in Mali, which is a large country in West Africa. And uh, Mali is known for its great sandstorms and dirt storms. And this, these uh, sandstorms will blow uh, to the north sometimes into Europe, and then blow also to the west, or to, to North America, oftentimes depositing in the Caribbean Sea area. Um, the so-called Harmattan winds is what riles up this dirt and gets it, gets it blowing. And then as studies have shown that when it blows to the north, um, during those days when it's blowing that direction, there's increased emergency room visits to the hospitals, and there's also increased all-cause mortality during those days when the wind is blowing that direction. Likewise, when it's blowing to the west towards the Caribbean Ocean, um, some people are postulating this is contributing, at least in part, uh, to the, the death of the sea coral in the Caribbean Sea because of the dirt and also because of man-made pollutants that are part of, this, part of this dirt. And really understanding the composition of this dust and its pollutants is really the first step in really understanding of what we can do as far as the potential health effects and how we can mitigate those, those health effects. And although you can't change the winds, you can't make the Harmattan winds go away, perhaps it's something we can do to limit the man-made pollutants in the dirt or something that we can do to mitigate the harm to ourselves. And I had kind of a personal interest in this because I was living in Mali at the time, and my responsibility was to take care of the people working at the embassy, Americans in country, and also was concerned about the local population. And I met up with Dr. Uh, uh, Sunioka, who was the Japanese uh, doctor at the Japanese embassy, and he had similar concerns about his people and, and also about the area. So we got together in sort of a joint effort to try to find you know, some way in which we can possibly mitigate the health risk to our population and maybe potentially to... Uh, the country uh, people at large. Um, so we looked at various organizations that could possibly help us. Uh, we looked at ways we can possibly fund this project. As you all researchers know, funding is a key to making a successful project. It's a very, very difficult part of, part of research. But ultimately, this led to a setting up two monitoring stations, one at each of the U.S. embassies. And the equipment and the cost was funded by the U.S. Geological Survey, so we got the funding part out of the way. And then we had to do the actual work at our embassies, both the Jap Japanese embassy and the U.S. embassy. And we're hoping that the first set of data will be available soon. Um, this project got under, just got underway about six months ago. Um, but this, for me, was a very exciting project for several reasons. One, we were studying something that really hasn't been studied before. No one's really looked at the composition of this dirt in Mali in the source country. Some people looked at it in Europe and looked at it in the Caribbean, but not in the source country. So no one really knows for sure what is in this dirt at the country at large. 
but also this is something that could possibly impact a large, you know, millions of people in, in West Africa. So if we can find some solution to this harmful dirt, then maybe we can do something to help a large population of people healthier. And the last very satisfying part of this was just a, a joint effort of, of international partners, you know, working with a Japanese colleague and making things happen as two countries that come together with a common cause and a common purpose. So with this small uh, get-together, this small cooperative effort, brings us to a much larger cooperative effort, and that was the Tohoku crisis and the U.S. Embassy response in, in coordination and cooperation with the Japanese government and the Japanese people. This is a photo taken out in front of the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. This was taken right after the earthquake, so it's actually before the tsunami, and it's before the uh, Fukushima disaster. And at this point in time, even now, people are getting together trying to decide what's the next step. You know, what are we going to do uh, to help, uh, help the U.S. citizens and country and also help the Japanese government? So what happened was that very same day, and then the next day, um, in order to kind of effectively address the various multi-dimensional multi multi aspect of this crisis, the embassy stood up a uh, several task force. And one of them was the, um, the, the Japan Emergency Command Center, which is set up on the left-hand picture. And what this center was is a, a, both American and Japanese employees who uh, they would translate the news reports, they would get the information in from the field, they would communicate back into the field what was going on and give direction. They'd also communicate information as it came into the Japanese government and back to Washington, to the U.S. government for further direction. And on the right-hand side is the um, American Citizen Services Task Force, and this was involved in helping American citizens and country. So, again, a major part of what a U.S. embassy or embassy in country does is help the, the citizens and country. At the time of this disaster, there was 160,000 Americans in Japan. Uh, the embassy Tokyo Concert Crisis Response Center, uh, the group we just looked at, um, was started on March 11th, the same day of the disaster. And basically, over the next four weeks, they worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, taking in about 5,400 uh, crisis cases of lost citizens or citizens in distress, and basically fielded thousands of phone calls from American citizens. All in all, about 45 concert officers were brought in from outside countries into Japan to assist in this effort. Um, the concert assistant field teams were also formed, a couple of pictures you see there, out in the Sendai area, in the areas where the disaster took place, and also at the airports at Narita and Haneda Airport. Uh, uh, a number of buses were uh, leased to bring people back out of the area, and essentially you know, thousands of American citizens had to be uh, assisted in getting back to home. And this was a, a effort, you know, important for American citizens, but also for the Japanese government, because the American embassy felt it was important to take responsibility for our citizens and get them out of the country so the Japanese uh, authorities can concentrate on their citizens and the problems that they have to deal with, and not, not Americans that sometimes can be pretty needy. So, um, delving more into the humanitarian assistance side, um, the USAID's, or the U.S. Agency for International Development's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance is really the lead U.S. government agency uh, for international disaster response and humanitarian assistance. And pretty much as soon as Ambassador Roos made a declaration of a disaster, uh, the word went to Washington, and the first uh, disaster assistance response team was sent to, uh, to the Tohoku area. And all in, in total, 144 disaster assistance personnel were sent in from the United States to assist with the initial uh, search and rescue uh, alongside uh, Japanese fire departments and Japanese authorities. And as of the end of uh, June of the 2011, um, the job was pretty much done as far as the USAID team was concerned and left, uh, left behind millions of dollars worth of equipment to assist the ongoing efforts of the local prefectures and also left behind about 10,000 uh, person protective equipment for the Japanese Self-Defense Force to use in the ongoing operation. So after the initial search and rescue efforts took place, um, we now had to get into providing assistance to the people that, that were affected. So Operation Tomodachi was initiated. And this was established based on the wake of the tsunami as a bilateral response to the two governments getting together, um, uh, pooling resources uh, to be the, the most efficient. So the Japanese Self-Defense Force uh, sent out, I believe, around 100,000 uh, soldiers to the area, about half of their population. Um, they provided the initial search and rescue efforts also, support and to recovery to the to population and life support. Um, and all in all, they did a, an excellent job, an admiral job. And I spoke to a number of uh, military personnel from the U.S. government after the fact, and they had nothing but very, very high praise and admiration of the high level of professionalism, um, dedication, uh, in dealing with this disaster. And just imagine being in your home country, and, uh, as you all were, and just seeing you know, dead friends and dead relatives having to deal with this day to day. So they did an excellent and admirable job. Um, on the U.S. side for the first 10 days, um, the U.S. Force of Japan was the leading military headquarters for the U.S. response and coordinating that response. 
And by about March 24th, uh, the Seventh Fleet became involved. And formed what's called the Pacific Command um, Joint Task Force 519. And this is basically the Seventh Fleet getting involved with the Japanese, with the uh, American forces already in Japan, forming what I have the kind of nickname of a Super Joint Support Force of Japan. And so this was the basic um, people that got involved in, in Operation Tombadachi. Uh, while outer communications were set up with the Japanese Self-Defense Force uh, and counterparts uh, were placed in each different facility and liaisons with our government were sent to Japanese uh, military government and, and likewise, and they had a good core of communication back and forth so they could have a coordinated response. Uh, and this basically formed the core of what the Operation Tomodachi was because if you don't have good command and control, you can't have a good effort that's going to work together and work efficiently uh, to help save lives. So in total, about 24,000 U.S. soldiers and troops were involved in Operation Tomodachi, about 24 naval vessels and hundreds of aircraft, um, bringing in uh, millions of pounds of support into, into the Sendai area. Um, Operation Tomodachi, the official uh, initial part, ended uh, this the summer of 2011, but the Tomodachi idea initiative still continues today at the U.S. Embassy. And the American Ambassador, Ambassador Roos, has set up the Tomodachi program, which is really a, a joint effort of commercial donors of both the Japanese and American side, um, don't, donating money to support uh, educational exchange, uh, culture exchange, and perhaps even public health and medical exchange uh, between the U.S. And, and Japan. And I personally would love to see us be able to uh, bring Japanese physicians over, uh, public health experts over to study in, in the United States, especially ones that come from the Tohoku area. They can then go back to Japan and help out the people further. Now, as part of the Operation Tomodachi, we had to have a place in order to get people in they get supplies and get people in. And after the tsunami, um, the Sunday airport was basically devastated. And as you can see by these pictures, it's just totally covered in mud. And many people at the time felt that there's just no way this airport can get back up and running within a short period of time to be helpful during Operation Tomodachi. But essentially, U.S. forces of Japan, the Japanese Self-Defense Force, and private citizens in the area felt differently. And by March 20th, um, Japanese and U.S. forces had cleared the entire runway, and the first C-17 had landed at, at that time. So you're just talking nine days after the disaster. Um, the U.S. Japanese forces, U.S. and Japanese forces established a bilateral coordination effort where the U.S. forces maintained command and control of the airport, while the Japanese Self-Defense Forces did the direct, you know, hands-on aid to the people, people in need. And after about 22 days, the U.S. Air Force controllers had controlled you know, hundreds of aircraft into the area and millions of pounds of supplies and equipment were brought into the Sendai Airport. Um, eventually, uh, after a couple of months, the control was handed back over to the Japanese air controllers, and on April 1st, the first commercial flights landed in the Sendai Airport. Essentially, less than one month after this disaster, this, this airport was cleaned up and flights were arriving. I visited Sendai Airport in August of 2011. When I got there, I walked into what was a brand new terminal, a beautiful building, it looked like nothing had ever happened. And this is extremely impressive that five months after such a devastating event, you have a brand new beautiful terminal. And it really showed the, uh, the determination of Japanese people. And I firmly believe that could have never have happened in the United States, something so quickly. Um, the United States National Regulatory Commission also became involved early on. On March 11th, um, the, the NRC activated um, an operation center in, in the United States. On March 12th, they sent a team over uh, to Japan to start helping uh, with the nuclear crisis. And by March 14th, a local a task force was set up at the U.S. Embassy and in Japan. And later, March 17th, a task force was set up in Washington to communicate with the task force in Japan, maintaining a close link with what was going on radiation-wise and uh, giving advice to the, the U.S. government, the U.S. Embassy, and the Japanese counterparts. There are multiple other agencies that were involved uh, in, the, in ground sampling for analysis concerning radiation. Um, the Department of Energy, for example, collected uh, numerous samples that were analyzed in Japan by Japanese agencies and also by the Department of Defense on the American side and back in Washington. And a, and a database was consolidated that was distributed to everybody involved. And basically, the aim of the Department of Energy uh, radiation monitoring with support was to collect data, provide measurements and technical advice on the radioactive contamination and radiation exposure and support of not just the State Department but also the uh, Department of Defense uh, forces that were in place doing the humanitarian assistance to make sure that they were protected and they were safe, and also giving the same information to the Japanese government and their people so that everybody could be that they were safe and working in a safe environment and not exposing themselves to excessive radiation. So the Department of Energy conducted over 530 hours of aerial measurements also, and um, eventually this was handed over to MEX. The Department of Energy and its field teams covered about 42,000 miles of roadways and took over 3,400 ground measurements in total. 
Um, at the end of their operation, they handed most of the equipment back over to the Japanese local authorities to do ongoing operations and sampling of the, of the, the radiation contamination in the area. Also, the ocean buoys were placed in various areas um, around the Sendai area for monitoring of, of ocean currents and where, what direction potential con contamination might be going after that. So the Department of Energy in-country team returned to the states back in May of 2011, again, left uh, behind a large amount of equipment to the local population. The DOE continues to efforts today back in Washington, coordinating back and forth and communicating back and forth with the Japanese government authorities you know, as needed. And since the crisis began, began, the U.S. mission in Japan had engaged in a, a number of other people who came in the country to help out, uh, pertaining to health, uh, food, environment, and, uh, and other various ways. Um, the U.S. government experts from uh, a number of agencies came, including the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for food and safety issues. And also the DOD has what's called the Department of Veterinarian Services. And they're actually the arm in country here in Japan that does food monitoring. And they continued food monitoring throughout the entire crisis of different food sources coming in, particularly to the Tokyo area and into the military bases. Uh, the National Cancer Institute was involved in, in addressing radiation issues and health issues. And the Center for Disease Control and Prevention was involved for risk communication, which is obviously a very big issue that took place during this time. And the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration was involved in ocean monitoring. Um, it was felt by the U.S. government to be important to be able to really assist the Japanese government any way we possibly could. And so during the relief efforts and after, and this continues even today, um, you know, comprehensive information has been posted on, on the U.S. Uh, website, U.S. Embassy website. And today, uh, it even continues, and Ambassador Roos, during the time of the crisis, gave multiple town hall meetings to American citizens and Japanese citizens alike, um, getting information out and trying to tell people what was happening. So, in conclusion, this was obviously a, a terrible disaster. Um, a lot of people were affected. But when I look back on this disaster and disasters in other countries, disasters that occurred in the United States, the Japanese people really behaved admirably. And you should be very proud of what took place here, proud of the work that you did. And uh, the U.S. Embassy and U.S. government was just happy to be a part of them and help any way we can with that. Um, I thank you very much for the time, and I appreciate the chance to speak with you today.